Hi YouTube, this is Joe Calton with Calton Cutlery. You can find me on the web, CaltonCutlery.com. Okay, so this is the second video in the, um, I think I titled uh, the first one, um, Making a New Knife Pattern. Um, and the first video, I believe, was Making a New Knife Pattern, Deciding What to Make, I think, or something like that. Okay, so uh, we left off on the last video um, that... Uh, you know, I make a whole bunch of these uh, Carter pattern neckers, okay, um, and they are straight out of uh, Murray Carter's book, 101 Knife Designs. Um, this, to me, was one of those patterns that, you know, I, I bought Murray's first book, and I read it, and I really enjoyed it, and then when his second book came out, you know, I was, I was flipping through the book, and I remembered seeing the neck knife pattern in the first book, and it was one of those knives that... I didn't really know what to think to begin with. You know, I mean, I am a, a, a mostly a, a, you know, a traditional, you know, full guard, uh, you know, four inch hunter type of guy, right? Well, so when I saw this one and, you know, it didn't have a guard, um, you know, and it had this, um, this funky little finger choil right here. And I was looking at it and I'm like, man, you know, there's just something about that knife, you know, and I can't quite put my finger on it, so the easiest way to understand a knife is just to go ahead and make one and then play around with it for a couple of months and see, see if you like it, what you do like and what you don't like. Well, you know, I made the knife and I started carrying it. I believe it was this one right here. This one's out of 1095. I believe this is the first one of that pattern that I ever made. And, you know, it, it took a little bit of getting used to, but I really started enjoying it quite a bit. For a in-town type of knife, where um, you know you you'd like to be discreet, um, not because you're breaking the law or anything, but just because some people get freaked out when they see, you know, a, a fixed blade belt knife or you know a fixed blade neck knife, you know, hanging outside of your t-shirt. And you know, I mean, if that's uh, you know what they want to do, then you know that's kind of their business. Um, and you know, I, I kind of get a lot of flack with this on some of my videos when I say, you know, I'd much rather be, you know, sort of discreet or, you know, not to, to freak people out. Like, I was telling the story of, uh, you know, when I was a, a PTO president of my boys' uh, grade school. And, you know, I would go in and volunteer in the class, um, mostly in kindergarten through, like, first, second, and third grade. Although I, I kept going, you know, until they got into middle school. Once they get into middle school... They don't want you around, and the schools don't want you around anymore. The schools might say they want you around, but that's just really lip service so that they can, you know, say, hey, you know, we asked for parent involvement. Anyway, so, you know, if you're helping out in a, you know, in a, a school classroom or, you know, something like that, and you need to sharpen a pencil or, you know, you get a hangnail or something like that, you know, you, you know, friendly looking knives that are, um, you know, not very flashy, and they're fairly discreet, are honestly, to me, a lot more handy than, you know, a really flashy, really aggressive type of knife. <coughs> and, you know, people have got their opinions on that. You know, this is my opinion on that, and this is my video, so that's what I'm telling you. Anyway, so, um, so this particular knife design, with this finger choil and the cutout right here, what I found is that it pretty much takes your traditional um, here's an old one it takes your traditional finger guard you know so that you know when if you were to uh, you know jab the the point into something you know you're carving a pumpkin or um, you know opening up a box or something like that and your hands a little bit wet you know, that, that guard really saves wear and tear on your, your index finger. Well, on this, with a full guard, that's all in the, the index finger, right? All that pressure is in the index finger. With this design, it splits it. Uh, let's see. There we go. It splits it in between your index finger and your middle finger, depending upon how deep this is. But when you grab that thing, it acts like a a guard that's just shared in between the two fingers. So in my experience this has been a very very secure pattern in the hand. Um, you guys know I like to fish a lot, I like to hunt a lot. Um, <coughs> 
I don't know how many trout I've dressed out with one of these patterns. Um, as far as game animals, uh, cottontails, uh, grouse, um, I think a couple of jackrabbits even. Um, let's see, uh, sheep, antelope, mule deer. Can't remember if I've done a whitetail deer or not. Um, they are a little bit on the small side for like say, you know, a, a full size, like a 300 pound hog. Um, and like buck mule deer, these are a little bit um, on the small side for my taste anyway. Um, the necker version of this. Now, that's what we're going to fix on this is, uh, is turn this from a dedicated necker pattern to a belt knife pattern. Because I told you in the last video that most of the time I carry one of these patterns as a belt knife instead of as a neck knife. Okay. So the changes that we're going to want to make, <coughs> now the, the class of use, first of all, I guess, is going to be, for me, the same. All around, every day, um, you know, these are, I consider them light to medium duty knives, just because I make them so, you know, I, I basically cut as much weight out of them as I can. So they've got either thin to very thin grinds, they're made out of 16th inch stock, um, they, I usually try to stick with light uh, wood, um, you know, handle materials, um, really thin sheaths, uh, you know, so, so I try to take all the weight that I can out of these while still giving you a useful um, utility type knife. This belt knife version of this is going to, I'd like to keep most of that, but I do want a little bit more blade, a little bit more handle, the same... Um, probably about the same width, the same point style um, as what my newer ones have. Um, and I'm, you know, I haven't decided whether I'm going to make it out of 3 seconds or 16th inch stock. You know, I mean, you know, you don't have the weight consideration. Um, you know, when you're making, when you're carrying a necker, every quarter ounce, you know, is a lot of weight to be hanging around your neck all day long. A quarter ounce on your belt doesn't seem like near the amount of weight that a quarter ounce on your on your neck is. Okay, so so we can have a, I mean we could probably double the weight of that knife. I think these weigh about two ounces, so we could go clear to clear to four ounces and still maintain a nice light slim um, city type uh, EDC sort of knife. You know something that's nice and discreet yet. Um, you know, very useful and has enough size to be useful, but yet isn't over, over big or cumbersome or anything. Something that's nice and light and slim and you, that you want to slip onto your belt before you leave the house in the morning. So, <clears throat> what we're going to do here is, um, okay, so this one was the very first one, okay? So we'll go through a couple of design changes here. This one was the very first one out of 1095, okay? If we hold that one up, now granted these knives have been, um, they've had at least an eighth of an inch of the blade width sharpened away through honest use, you know. Um, so, if you look at these two, what's, you know, I mean, what's left of them, um, you can see that the, the second version has got a slightly smaller handle than the first version does. It's a narrower blade right off the bat. Not so much where the, the edges are, but look down here where your, um, I guess, Ricasso is, um, you know, because that part doesn't get ground away when you sharpen. So this is considerably narrower than this one is. Um, it also has, this one has a little bit less belly or a little bit more point, whichever way you want to look at it, okay? So now let's take that version and put it up next to this version right here. Now this one was the very first uh, pattern welded blade that I ever made. And then I carried this knife um, for at least a year. Um, and it does okay, you know, I mean, um, it's got, uh, this one won't quite hold, you know, hang with 1095 as far as straight up cutting performance, but it does have more flexible strength than straight 1095 due to the, the 15 and 20 in there. So it's it's kind of a trade-off. The newer um, pattern welded steel that I, I make now, it will cut with my my straight up 1095, 
and it has more toughness. So, and you know, they're they're cool looking. You know, I mean, you got the pattern welded steel going on there. <coughs> but you can see how this one right here um, has got even more point and less belly. Um, it's probably about the same width there. I mean, without getting a ruler out and looking at it, and it's got a little bit longer handle. And it's got a little bit more of a drop point to it, I guess. But this one, you know, since it didn't hold an edge quite as well, it did get worn quite a bit. So now let's look at the last one. And this one is, you know, it's a pretty nice one also. And it's, you know, again, about that same width, a little bit pointier point than this one and a little bit less belly and a slightly longer handle on this one. So anyway, so this one um, comes from this pattern right here. You can see that's that's mighty dang close. We get a little bit of the drop in the handle. Um, you can see how this one extends past the pattern. And that has to do with, um, I edge quench these knives. And when you edge quench, a lot of times that steel will want to curve in, you know, towards the edge a little bit and you'll you'll get a little bit of curve in there which is one of the things that I love about patterns so much so <clears throat> actually we'll go ahead and uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to make here and then um, and then I'll go into some of the advantages of patterns so we have got actually no I'm just going to hold it <coughs> okay so what we've got here is we've got my favorite pattern, um, the uh, original model neck knife, and the uh, the seven inch. No, what this was, I see that 110 and 115. What I did, uh, here. That's what I did, see? You see the 110 and 115%? <clears throat> when I was changing these up to see what I liked, I took the original model neck knife, and that is, um, I think I'm just ground a little bit of the edge off of this one to make it narrower. But that was full size, straight out of the book, copied. And then I adjusted the copy machine to 110%, got this knife, and 115%, and got this knife. So what I'm kind of thinking that I want to do is I want to take this one right here, narrow the blade down a little bit, but keep this blade length, and then put this blade length on this handle size, um, and then probably straighten, straighten the pattern, the handle out a little bit. <coughs> and then the reason for that, like I said, is, is a lot of times when you're doing an edge quench, uh, this one will probably show up easier. When you're doing an edge quench and when you're quenching the blade, you know, to here, you'll also get some of this part in the handle gets quenched also. Now, when you quench that, you quench the edge and not the spine, it'll tend to want to curve in a or curve a little bit like this when you're quenching in oil. They tell me that the Japanese katanas, the, the way they get their curve, backwards curve, is quenching in water and the edge portion actually expands and then pushes it out that way. You know, I don't uh, quench stuff in water, so I really couldn't tell you. But I do know that in oil, not all the times, but a lot of times, you will get downward curve. And so if you're using a pattern, you can adjust your pattern for stuff like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make, uh, this is the big one, we're going to take this blade, put it with the other one's handle, and then we're going to straighten this out just a little bit so that when we go through the heat treating process, um, we'll get a little bit of curve and it'll be just about perfect. Okay? So, <coughs> um, pattern materials. Okay, pattern materials. I get, I go down to the salvage yard, um, and if the salvage yard has steel, you know, light, nice, light, thin uh, sheet stock like this, I get it from the salvage yard, because if the salvage yard, it's, I don't know, it's sold by the pound. 
and it's uh, considerably cheaper than going to the steel yard, um, which is uh, you know a welding supply type place. And of course, they're real proud of their stuff, and they say it's all new, even though it's rusted. Sometimes it's bent and warped and all that kind of stuff. It's brand new steel, they say, and so you got to pay for it as brand new steel prices, even if you're just getting little bitty pieces of it. So this particular sheet is uh, 56 thousandths thick. So roughly 16 gauge, I guess, something like that. So I buy, you know, a big old sheet of it and then bring it to the shop and then cut strips off of it to be about the size of the pattern that I'm going to make and then uh, make the pattern out of that. It's just mild steel. Um, for fixed blade knives, um, I just use thin, mild, uh, mild steel uh, patterns. Um, for my pocket knives, <coughs> those have got interchangeable parts, or not inter uh, inter, uh, you know, parts that act together, and so um, uh, they need to be a lot more precise, and so I use, uh, uh, I think I'm using eighth inch 1095 for that, and then once I make the pattern, I'll make a knife off of it, and then, or actually once I make the pattern, I'll go ahead and harden it, leave it at full hardness, and then make the knife off that pattern. And then if I want to make any changes, I can change the pattern, and then from then on, you know, every knife will be different after that. <coughs> so let's put this away. <coughs> and that is one of the beauties of patterns. You know, when I first started off being a knife maker, I didn't believe in patterns. Um, you know, I mean, I thought that I was, you know, custom knife maker, which I am. Um, you know, but that for some reason, you know, custom knife makers didn't use patterns. Well, um, that kind of, I think Murray's book kind of changed my thinking on that a little bit. And it might have been about that time that I started getting into an awful lot more production type knives. Like instead of making every single knife, every single one was hand forged. It was all ground uh, or all um, finished to 2000 grit on the blade and etched. Handles were finished down to 2,000 grit. Guards were finished to 2,000 grit. Um, sheaths were all hand-tooled, um, you know, I mean, really nice-looking knives. But at the time, <coughs> in my career as a knife maker, um, I think I told you guys about this when we were going, uh, saying goodbye to the old shop. You know, I mean, I was getting 115 bucks for a, a, a small game or a small game knife, complete with guard, hand-tooled sheath, 2,000 grit, everything, right? And honestly, I just couldn't make any money at that. I mean, I understand that this, I mean, I've told you guys, this is kind of my fun business and everything, and I do it mostly because I enjoy it. Well, but there's also, you know, kind of a justification there, you know? I mean, um, yeah, you do something because you enjoy it, but at some point, you know, when the power hammer break, breaks, you know, there's got to be income to be able to fix the power hammer. Or if the bandsaw goes out and I need to get a new bandsaw. At some point, you should be making a profit to be able to pay for equipment and more research and development and all that kind of stuff. So it's much better, to, in my eyes, to treat even a fun business as a business um, and run it for profit and everything. And that way, you know, it pays for itself. I mean, things are an awful lot more fun when you're, you know, when you're eating hamburgers instead of ramen noodles. <coughs> okay, so uh, the pattern. So what we've got here is we've got three pieces of, uh, you know, I just cut these off that bigger piece. If the, the steel is nice and new and it hasn't been outside and it's all nice and bright and shiny, a lot of times it'll help to put um, dicum on it. Like this stuff right here, uh, this is by Sterrett, uh, I think they call it Clean Scribe and not Dicum, but it's layout dye, so it's got a little brush in here, and it turns everything blue, uh, and it's cool and everything, but most of the time, if steel's been laying out in a yard before you buy it, it's all nice and rusty, so it'll work just fine there. So then we need a couple of clamps. So we got a couple of clamps here. So what I said was, I want to take the big knife, 
and this is why I don't ever throw patterns away or change patterns or, um, you know, modify them or anything like that, really, because they don't take up all that much space. You've already built the thing, you know, if you want to change it, use it to scribe a new pattern and then change the new pattern. That way you always have the original pattern. Now, some of your old patterns will just suck. And those, you know, hey, throw them away, melt them down, grind them up, do whatever. I mean, if it's a particularly bad pattern, you know, feed it point first into a grinder and then do a happy dance on the, the, um, uh, the shavings. So anyway, so what we're going to do here is I already told you that we're going to narrow this blade up. But what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and scribe the whole knife on here. Only move one clamp at a time. Okay, so you should be able to see that knife on there. See the lines? Okay, so we got the knife there. <clears throat> and that is the original model neck knife that's been uh, enlarged to 115%. So we want that blade length. But we want this size, the 110% handle size. So what we can do is come up in here. And we're going to line everything off with a point right here. We'll just freehand that point in there. Okay. So we're going to line this point up. And then we're going to kind of line the blade up with it. Now what we're going to do is we'll go ahead and clamp the blade portion up. And now we'll go ahead and build in that, that little bit of straightness that I was telling you about in the, um, in the, you know, in the relation between the blade and the handle. Now we'll come in and go ahead and scribe out the handle. <clears throat> okay, now let's make some X's here where the, the old handle was. That looks, that's starting to look pretty good. I don't know how much y'all are going to be able to see of this. So I'll just tilt it around a little bit until hopefully, hopefully I'll find a spot in there that it looks good. Okay, so now we've got that smaller handle with the larger blade, the longer blade, but it's also, you know, wider. And I like a narrower blade than that for an EDC. So now let's narrow that blade up. And actually what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and, um, you know, purposely wear it down. So we'll go ahead and take um, the width off of the edge portion, and then we'll probably bring this choil in a little bit more, and then and then I think we'll be about where we want to be for uh, until we grind it out or cut it out. So <clears throat> we're taking my favorite one since I like that edge profile and just using it kind of as a um, Kind of as a guide here. I mean, I'm not going to use it, you know. No, I think I can do that. I'm just going to line this up like this, and then we're going to come up in here, bring that in up in there, then move the whole pattern forward until it lines up with the point. And the belly uh, portion is still lined up. Okay. That looks good. So now we're just going to need to, so now we've got the blade that we want. 
this top line up in here. Okay, and then we've got the handle that we want, the inside or the, the top line again. Now, the relation of these finger grooves needs to change a little bit. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and do that on the grinders and everything. So let's go ahead and um, we'll go ahead and cut this out. And for that, I just use, uh, you know, my porta band here. And I've got a table. I don't use a push stick all that much. <clears throat> I know everybody says, you know, use a push stick, use a push stick, use a push stick. But I find it with this table right here. I suppose for liability reasons, I should probably tell you, hey, use a push stick like everybody else, right? But this isn't how you should do it. This is how I do it. So I use this table and I brace my hands on this table cons uh, an awful lot. Once the cut gets past the, the, the blade, a lot of times you'll see me reach around and grab this portion of it and anyway, it works. Okay, so let's go ahead and cut it out. Okay, so we've got it rough cut out, and boy, let me tell you, that is starting to feel, I think we're going to nail this one. I think that one's starting to feel mighty good just the way it is already, and we still got a rough grinder. <coughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and come on in here, into the new grinding room. Oh. Now, the new grinding room is working amazing. Um, I'm not going to turn the fan on. Because it's probably going to be louder. Well, no, maybe I would. Let's see if I can get you all up in here to where you can really see the. Okay, so now at this point right here, this is an old 36 grit belt. <clears throat> and we are just going to grind up pretty much kind of close to the line. Some lines we'll go ahead and grind right up to, like this back curve here. Um, or we'll get it mighty close uh, this away, and then we'll come in, we'll move the platen out of the way, or the rest out of the way, and then we'll do it this way to kind of smooth the lines out. We'll round this portion off, and then we'll probably go to the, the small wheel grinder and, um, and grind this out. Um, and we'll really ease up on these two right here, and then probably finish out where the, the edge is going to be. So watch your ears or turn your volume down.
Oh boy, y'all. I think uh, this is starting to feel mighty good. I mean, even with no handle scales or anything, um, you know, that's, uh, I think I've got pretty high hopes for this one. All right, so now actually, let's go ahead and use this grinder. Uh, a lot of times, you know, that's why I have, that's why you have several grinders, is uh, to save time on belt changes. But this grinder right here is a lot quieter than my, uh, my two horse. And this is probably already really loud for y'all anyway. Alright, so... Y'all are at... Okay, there's the top of the platen. There's the bottom of the platen. So as long as I stay up in there, you ought to be able to see it. Okay, so now we got everything kind of roughed in with a 36 grit. Now we're going to uh, come in with a, a worn 220, because this is mild steel. It's really soft. Come in with a mild to, or the, the worn 220 and go ahead and get all of our scratches that we can get to going this away. Now up in here we'll have to go to the horizontal, the little bitty uh, 1x42. Um, and then we'll go ahead and deburr this because these burrs will kind of um, mess with your perception of the lines. I guess y'all can't see that and this is you know this is mostly for the new makers anyway right so we probably ought to go ahead and show you that so on the platen when you're trying to get into curves and everything on a regular you know 2 by 72 like an upright like this you know this is a home built jobber right because I'm entirely too cheap to spend I think the um, the Grizzlies I want to say they were like six or eight hundred bucks you know when when I got into all this now, this grinder didn't start off with this motor. It started off with a, um, uh, a hard wheel grinder motor, you know, 